our dear viewers and listeners. We greet you all in the precious and wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Again, this is the day the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to today's Bible study. We kindly request that you invite somebody to join you. And let's open up today's session with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Yes, Lord. For the reading of your word. Mm. For the entrance of your word gives light. Mm. It gives life. Mm. It gives wisdom mm. and understanding. Yes, Have your way in our spirit of the living God. Yes, Cause, reveal Jesus, mm. that our hearts might be yielded to the moving of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen. Amen. Today's reading is taken from the book of Romans. Chapter 1. And verse 17. The Bible says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, The just shall live by faith. What do we have here? We have a very important verse whereby you seem to be climbing onto a peak. And this verse is the key that unties what we have been reading all along. Here Paul is emphasizing on what he has previously talked about. In verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone that believes for the Jew first and also for the Greek. And then he begins to unpack that. Let's go back one moment. He begins by saying, I am not ashamed. In other words, what he's trying to emphasize is that this is a present ongoing attitude. It is something that is in a constant state of a, of a habitual lifestyle that he has implemented. And why is he not ashamed of the gospel? Because it is the power of God and to salvation. It is because the gospel has supernatural power to liberate all those who believe from the bondage of sin. So it doesn't matter what deviant lifestyle you have. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power to overcome that habit. It has the power to overcome that deviant lifestyle. The gospel is far more powerful than your sin. The gospel, Paul uses the word dunamis as power. It is from dynamis that you get dynamite. Basically, what it's trying to say is that the gospel has explosive power to change a life, to alter eternity. No other message has a deeper effect on a person's life than the gospel of Jesus Christ. It changes you inside out. That is why Paul later tells us that if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Why? Why? Because of the power 
inherent in the gospel. The gospel has the ability to totally transform any human being. It does not just paint the exterior. It totally reconstructs you as an individual. It brings down all the habits of sin. It totally rewires an individual and restructures your mind, your heart, and your will. You now have a new standing with God. You have new priorities. You get new pursuits in life. You have a new life direction. And finally, you have a new destiny. Why? Because of the power inherent in the gospel. And he says it is the power of God unto salvation. Salvation is the Greek word soteria. Which means deliverance from danger. Basically you are rescued from ruin. I have met a number of people who are saying save saved from what? You were saved from danger. Now, you may ask yourself, what danger is that? You need to jot down to verse 18. It says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. This is an all-inclusive clause. Basically, what that means is that outside of Christ, if you don't have Christ, you are a candidate of the wrath of God. So the wrath is poured out. Just and for all eternity to all those that do not receive Jesus Christ, that do not believe this gospel, so to be saved is to be rescued from the wrath that God is going to pour out on those that have not believed on the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, if God cannot save you, then God will damn you. So, and those are the ones that will suffer for all eternity. No wonder the writer in Hebrews tells us. Chapter 10 and verse 31. That it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So, outside of Christ, what you have is wrath. Outside of Christ, what you have is unrighteousness. Outside Christ, what you have is ungodliness. And then Paul tells us, he begins with a wonderful word, for. It is for in it, referring to the gospel, so referring to the gospel that saves, it says in this gospel is contained the righteousness of God. Now the Greek word for righteousness is the word dikaiosune. To help you understand what it means. In English, it will mean equity. It would mean justice. It would mean integrity. From where you get the word equal. 
And this word gets its meaning from the marketplace. When somebody went to buy grain, they would have a weighing scale. And what would happen is a scenario like we have here. So you would have a measure which is placed here. And then the grain is placed on the other side. So what the merchant would do? He would increase the grain to try and measure up so that this side and that side are equal. Now when they are equal, we then say this is the situation that we call Dikayosuni. This side equals the other side. So when we talk about righteousness, the idea is conforming to God's standard. So righteousness will mean that you are given what is due based on how you conform or fail to conform to the standard. And what you need to understand that the standard is not the human standard. The standard is God's standard. And you and I have to measure up. So when we come short, that's why the Bible says, all have fallen and fall short of the glory of God. In terms of righteousness, God does not smoothen the calf because of somebody who is better than all the others. His standard remains the same. And every one of us on that scale is measured and we come short in terms of meeting the divine holiness or moral perfection or being righteous in both words, actions, and judgments. So measured against the standard of righteousness, we all come short. So when we talk about the righteousness of God, it means God has set a requirement. He has set the mark for righteousness. And it is impossible for you and I in our fallen nature to be able to meet that requirement. So what happens? What happens happens is what we see in this verse 17. For the Bible says in the gospel is the righteousness of God. Basically what they want to say is that this righteousness has an origin. It has a belonging. It belongs to God. So in order for you and I to meet the standard, we need the gospel which has God's righteousness. And God's righteousness then adds to our unrighteousness. And then causes us to measure up to God's standard. That is what dikayosune is all about. So when we talk about righteousness, we implying that what you lacked where you fell short through faith in Jesus Christ you are now measuring up. You now meet the mark of God's righteousness. 
So why do we need the righteousness of God? I can't say it before. Without the righteousness of God, you and I are candidates to the wrath of God. So if you don't measure up, then you are a candidate to receive the wrath of God for all eternity. And why is that? Because God is holy. So Paul expands this and says, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. So what? unveils to us the righteousness of God is the gospel of Christ. So without the gospel of Christ men will perish. So how is this righteousness received? The only way to receive this righteousness is for us to have faith in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. You see, by Jesus' sinless life, he was able to meet the requirements of God as far as Dikayosune is concerned. So his death then becomes substitutionary. So his sinless life, his death now becomes a sin-bearing death. So in death, he carried the sin. And carrying that sin then means we who had the sin on us now become the righteousness of God through him. So outside him, we cannot attain that standard because the giver of this righteousness has already set the terms and this righteousness can only be received through faith in Jesus Christ alone apart from works. So it is not faith and works that saves. It is faith in Jesus Christ alone that saves. And Paul goes on to tell us, <coughs> for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. The word revealed is the Greek word apokupto. Apocrypto is where we get the word apocalypse. So which means unveiling. Imagine there is a statue that has to be erected. In front of a major building. Usually they cover it up. Then on the day of the function, the master of ceremony unveils this. He removes what was wrapping this statue. And then people have a revelation of what is there. Here the gospel says that the gospel of Christ has been revealed. It is unveiled to us. So now we have an unveiling to the sinful man. That yes, I may not measure up to the standard. I have come short. But what is revealed in the present continuous tense? The Bible says the dikayosune of God is apocalypto is now unveiled to us. 
Zibikuli tuli. So many of us make the mistake. Banje tukole so bi. We think righteousness is ours. Tulozo obutu kirivuva je tuli. But righteousness Ela is God's. Obutu kirivuva eri katonda. Isaiah 64:6 tells us that our righteousness is like filthy rags. Isaiah nkaga munya onyiro mukaga lugambo obutu kirivuva fibulinge ebigoye ebizira. So it does not make the weight. So what makes the weight is the righteousness of God. It is God acting on our behalf by appropriating Christ's righteousness to us. And then we measure up to his standard. So Paul goes on to emphasize how this righteousness is received. He says we receive this righteousness. And he writes and says it is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. What do we see in this one statement? Three words that are similar. In one sentence, we have repeated the word faith. It says the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written. But the righteous man shall live by faith. What is Paul trying to emphasize here? He's trying to emphasize that righteousness can only be linked to faith. And how does this happen? So we now need to explore what faith is all about. And we will go back. Remember I told you this is like scaling a mountain. Verse 17 takes you to the pinnacle. Now, for you to understand faith, we have to scale back to the beginning and understand what is the meaning of faith. The meaning of faith is found in verse 17. The Bible says, for it is in the righteousness of God that is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous, the just shall live by faith. Now, the word faith is the Greek word pistis which means to commit which means to trust in, which means to place reliance upon, to commit to, to trust in, and to place reliance on. Now, this involves the total human being in order to achieve this faith. It involves the mind. It involves the heart. And it involves the will. With the mind, a person comes to know the essential truths of the gospel. Now, having got to know the essential truth, then the heart is persuaded on the truthfulness that is inherent there. And brings the conviction to the righteous of his need for the righteousness of God. Now, having been convinced of the need for the righteousness of God, then the will takes a decision. So it is then a commitment to the life that Christ gives. So your will your mind and your heart then cooperate. This is an individual decision. 
It is a personal commitment. The church cannot do it for you. Your pastor, your leader cannot do it for you. Your spouse cannot do it for you. Your parents cannot make it for you. Your children can't make that commitment for you. This step of faith occurs at a fixed point in time. And at that moment, you enter through the narrow gate. Then once you are inside, you then move from faith to faith. So faith can be described as the eye that looks at Christ. The feet that run to him. And the hands that grasp him. And say, I will not leave you. This true faith is the saving faith. That is why we call receiving Christ and placing faith in Christ as one and the same thing. Now, having looked at the meaning of faith, let's look at the next one which is the object of faith. Look at what verse 2 to verse 4 says. It says which God promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Basically what this means is that faith in itself is important to save. Faith is no more powerful than the object of its trust. It is the object of faith that saves. So faith in the written scriptures, which horizon, which concern Jesus Christ, who was born an eternal son of God, both God and human as the Savior blessing faith in this Jesus is what saves. So any faith that we place in ourselves does not save. Faith in a denomination or a church cannot save. You cannot give you a right standing with God. You don't measure up. Faith in a religious ritual or a ceremony cannot save. You still come short. We must exercise exclusively faith in Jesus Christ. So anything else leaves you under the wrath of God. The only protection you have is when Jesus is the sole object of your faith. Now, having looked at the object of faith, we now move to the evidence of faith. What evidences that you have received this saving faith? Paul tells us in verse 5 that through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all the nations for his name. What characterizes that you have received this faith is obedience to the faith. You see, this is what he's saying. Obedience comes from faith. So, genuine obedience in Christ Jesus produces 
obedience to the faith as a result. So that is what Paul, I mean, what, what James tells us. In James chapter 2 and verse 26. Where he says that faith without works is dead. Why? Because faith without works is just an empty profession. I, I have been in sessions where people say, now let's see. Let's recite our professional faith. So, at reciting the profession of faith may be good. But as long as it does not flow from obedience to God, then it is null and void. It does not bring out the salvation. Anyone who believes in Christ comes under the authority of his lordship and then walks in obedience to his word. Now, this does not happen 10 years after. As soon as you receive Christ, the evidence of that transformation is the obedience to the life of faith. So, you continue. So if you are not obedient to the gospel, then you cannot repent. Then you cannot believe. You are disobedient. And you refuse to obey what Christ has put for you. True serving faith obeys what God has put in place. And then takes the initial step of obedience. And continues throughout the life of the Christian. So serving faith leads to many steps of obedience for the rest of your life. So having seen that, we ask ourselves the next question. What is the source of faith? Where does this faith come from? Verse 6 tells us, Among whom you also accord of Jesus Christ. You see, faith does not originate from the one who believes. Before you receive Christ, you are spiritually dead. Dead in your trespasses, dead in your sins. And dead men cannot exercise faith. So God must give you the gift of faith. And it is that gift of faith that then brings what was dead to life. You then believe and receive the salvation. You see, dead men cannot come to Christ. Dead men cannot believe. The only thing dead men can do is think. So, without the saving faith that God gives, the best you do is to run away from God. But Paul tells us that those who believe are called of God. So it is this call that brings life to what was dead. Like Jesus stood at the at the tomb of Lazarus. Lazarus was dead. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says, he who was dead. Came. So why did he come up? Because of the word that he had. So that faith brought him to life. And that is the analogy I can draw to us. When we are dead in our sins, through Christ, we are then granted that faith. It is that faith that then draws us to repentance. And we are then enabled to believe in Christ. 
Christo. And that's why the Bible tells us Bible in Romans chapter 11 and verse 36. Balumi kumi it says, For in him muye, and through him and to him are all things. Listen to what it says. So it says, For from him. So this faith comes from him. It is through him. And this faith points to him. That is the faith that we talk about. The source of this faith is God. So this being the source, let's look at the priority of this faith. Paul tells us in verse 8, First I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Here Paul establishes the priority of faith. This was a, a, a church in the midst of paganism. It was in the midst of so many vices. But their center was faith in Jesus Christ. Their faith in Jesus Christ is what was being proclaimed the world over. So it didn't matter whether they lived in an immoral city or lived among wickedness. Their faith stood out as light in the darkness. Their faith shone in the dark place. Their faith prevented them from being squeezed into the world. Their faith prevented them from blending in. They, they did not try to imitate the godless culture among them. And this faith is contagious. For Paul tells us that their faith spread throughout the Roman Empire. It is this faith that the right of Hebrews tells us that without it, it is impossible to please God. Because they that come to him must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So without faith, in simplest terms, faith diligently seeks after God. And faith lives for his reward. Which brings me to the question. Are you seeking after God? Are you living for his reward? That should be your priority. That should define the aspect of your life. That causes you to be inexplicable among your peers. This cannot be explained by your intelligence. It cannot be explained by your natural gifts. And this goes beyond your natural ability. So there, there is no explanation to this because your life is a life of faith in God. So, having prioritized this, we ask ourselves the next question. What is the power of this faith? Paul says in verse 12, that is that I may be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. What is Paul trying to state here? He says, I'm coming to you. But the reason I am coming to you is because you are men and women of faith. I am a man of faith. Now, our mutual faith, yours and mine, will profit both of us. You see, faith is contagious. One person's faith affects those he comes into contact with. Similarly, one person's unbelief contaminates the others that he comes into 
touch with. Mungeri yemu obuta kiliza bo muntu omu buono na bo naba mweto. Now what does the right of Proverbs says? Omwandi siwe nge na gamba. That iron sharpens iron. Ti nge chuma wechi wagala chuma 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 chuma. So one man sharpens another. Omuntu oma wagala mune. And the best way you see it is in a butcher's. Wogende li jevasa li denti. After cutting several times. This guy will lift up one panga and lift another one and then slide both together. So this removes everything that was on the edge. And then the panga becomes it effective in what it is doing. It is in the same way when your faith rubs off with others' faith. The two of you are sharpened. You rub off one another and the flames are stoked in your heart. And this mutual fellowship then blossoms and takes you off into another level. Let's look at the necessity of faith. Why is this necessary? Verse 16. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. For the Jew first and for the Greek. What is Paul trying to say here? He says this faith is found in no other you cannot receive it unless you receive the salvation of God. So how do you receive the salvation of God? You receive the salvation of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So there is no way to have divine righteousness except by faith. So salvation cannot be received except by faith. I am reminded of this wonderful hymn which says nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for grace. Helpless look to thee for grace. What is he trying to say here? Faith brings nothing in the hands. The only thing you come with is faith. An empty hand. And, and then you receive oh, oh. the righteousness of God which he gives adding nothing except faith in Jesus Christ. So, have you believed in Jesus Christ? Have you committed your life to him? You see, in conversion, you and I come to Christ. And when we come to Christ, it is like a, a wedding ceremony. When a bride and groom come before the altar, what happens? They commit to one another. So you commit to Christ. The one that is sinless. And that act of the will. Then causes you to receive his righteousness. Now having received this faith. What happens next? It is what we call the perseverance of faith. For the Bible says. In verse 17. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Now, what does it mean? It means this righteousness starts with faith. And it is faith from start to finish. The one that the writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What is he trying to say? We are moving from faith to faith. So it is faith all the way. Having entered this 
kingdom by faith. We continue to live in this kingdom by faith. So we don't enter by faith and then live by works. No, 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 no. It is faith into faith. And then Paul quotes Habakkuk. And says, for my righteous one shall live by faith. He said, true faith perseveres. True faith continues day by day. It is a walk of faith. It is a life of faith. Habakkuk 2 and 4 says the righteous man shall live is justified by faith shall live by faith that is what happens to us when we come to the faith we are then made righteous we measure up having measured up we now need to walk every day of our lives by faith it is faith that has brought you this far it is faith that this is a daily reality in a new direction. Faith is not just the initial step of committing to Jesus Christ. Faith is a continuous walk that takes the entirety of your life. This faith perseveres. A God-given faith never becomes an enemy. So it is theoretically impossible if Jesus is both the author and the finisher of your faith. The faith he authors matures and perfects to the end. So it is impossible for that faith to come from faith and get to no faith. So faith can only move in one direction forward. So faith can only advance from faith to faith. You cannot have faith going to apostles. You cannot have faith to unfaith. So that's why Paul writes to us in the book of Philippians and he says it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do or and to work for his good pleasure. So this faith can only take him forward. God willing, God taking you forward. So whatever we are, the importance of faith is very clear. You can't be saved apart from faith. You can't be sanctified apart from faith. You cannot be what God desires you to be without faith in Jesus Christ. You cannot experience the abundant life that Jesus gives apart from faith in him and his finished work. So when we talk about faith, it should cover every aspect of your life. It is not just your church life, but your business life. It covers your family life. It covers your recreational life. You are not meant to be self-reliant. You were meant to live by faith in the Son of God. So having received the righteousness, now faith that grows from faith. faith. Have you received this righteousness? If you have not, make this decision today. Let's pray. Say, Father God, I thank you 
for your righteousness that has been revealed in Christ Jesus. Today I understand that apart from Jesus Christ I am a sinner facing your wrath. I am ungodly. I am unrighteous. Lord, today I accept what Christ has done for us. Christo I receive ntwala this by faith. I believe that he is the son of God. The savior of the world. Save me Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Change my perspective. Change my priority. Change my work. Help me to live this life abundantly for you. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Having received the righteousness of God now, you need to walk by faith. There is that number on your screen. Please call it. Somebody will receive it. I will provide you the guidance that you need to walk this journey from faith to faith. Because the righteous ones shall live by faith. Now to the righteous ones, faith perseveres. Persevered in the end. From dominion church, it's always a pleasure to have you. And as we live in righteousness and faith, till the day when he either appears or falls asleep, may your life be a blessing to me. God, which is blessing.